welcome. Thank you for joining us on this new thrilling adventure of our Lunch and Learn series in which we will guide you through an expedition through life at Wood. We'll be showcasing a new profession every month and providing you with a comprehensive glimpse into their daily routine from sunrise all the way to sunset, their contributions and the distinctive duties and obligations that they bear in their role. This is the type of content that you have all asked for and we hope to inspire you to take a role in energy. So today I have the pleasure of interviewing Stephanie Wood L. And she is an amazing employee at Wood who has an exec, you know, a leadership role. And she's gonna tell us a little bit more about herself and what she does today. And then we're gonna get into the fun things, which is, you know, what do you do for a living? What does that look like? And what does your day look like? So thank you, Stephanie, for being here today. Yeah, thank you very much. Really excited for the conversation. So tell us a little bit, uh, a short bio, you know, who is Stephanie, where were you born and kind of what was your career path into um, the beginning? Yep, absolutely. Um, so I born and raised in Houston, um, currently still working in Houston, so have not gone far. Um, coming out of high school, I always knew I wanted to go to Texas A&M, um, so studied and, and went to Texas A&M. Um, I graduated so much from an education perspective. My background is in accounting and finance. Um, I do have a CPA by trade. Um, out of college, I went to kind of the, the standard CPA track, um, went and did public accounting with PricewaterhouseCoopers here in Houston. Um, it was a really um, exciting experience coming out of college, um, you know, spent three years there, but knew that I wanted to be in the corporate world in, um, in what we would call industry from an accounting perspective. So really focused on supporting a business and getting into the finance community within, within a business as opposed to on the audit side. So 13 years ago, came across um, and joined Wood um, and had the opportunity to join as a financial analyst in our reporting and consolidations group. So really started um, cutting my teeth in the business and understanding how the, the global business came together from a financial perspective. Um, so, you know, got to see uh, how the whole project's organization from a, a global perspective came together from a financial point of view. It's really interesting from a career journey perspective, because after a few years in that role, I was actually offered the position to take over the leadership of our global um, consolidations team for the projects business. And at that point in time, I had a young son. So I have two kids now. My son's 11. My daughter is eight. Um, but at the time, my son was very young and I felt quite overwhelmed thinking about taking on a leadership role at that point in my life. Um, and I actually turned the role down not once, but twice. Um, and ultimately ended up stepping into that leadership role in the consolidations group. And I'll tell you, it was probably the most transformational part of my career that I, if I could pinpoint one of those decisions where you go, had I, had I made that decision differently, I would probably be in a completely different space today. Um, so ultimately decided to take on that leadership role, um, you know, with all of the fear and anxiety that came with that at that point in my life. Um, and it was a wonderful opportunity. Um, after a couple of years leading that that team, I took a step back and, and you know really thought about what I wanted to do next and realized I had a gap and hadn't sat embedded in the business from a finance perspective. So sought out a role as a finance manager in our offshore engineering group. So sat partnered with the business alongside the business, helping with um, you know, sitting in project reviews from a finance perspective, supporting them through budget and forecast cycles, um, supporting through them, them through the monthly and annual close process to understand the, the productivity and the um, financial performance of their business. So did that for a couple of years. Um, and then in 2018, when or late 2017, when Wood and Amit Foster Wheeler came together, there was an opportunity to move back into the corporate organization. Um, leading our FPNA and reporting group and really setting out the new process for what would be our, our new America's business for the combined and consolidated new wood organization. So um, after having a couple years in the business, took that opportunity on and had a really unique and exciting experience setting out and paving the way of designing new processes for our, our budgeting and forecasting um, suite of activities and the monthly close and financial reporting um, activities as well. So that was a really unique um, experience. And again, one that that kind of took some some courage to step into given it was it was paving paving the way for some new processes in a new business that didn't previously exist. Um, 
After that, I had the opportunity to step into a VP of finance role. So took over um, the responsibility from a finance perspective, again, partnering back with the business of our America's upstream, midstream capital projects business. So took the experience I had as a finance manager and, and took that kind of up a level and um, sitting alongside the executive team within that organization, helping them to understand their financial performance and what they could do to ensure that they were as, as um, profitable as possible. So after that, um, after that experience, I had the opportunity to step into the controller role for the Americas. So again, a slightly different lens of really partnering with the business within the finance organization. Um, so being able to, to consolidate that global position um, for our, our uh, what was the Americas business at the time um, and, and working alongside our group corporate um, finance team and ensuring that we had that connectivity from the BU to the group um, perspective. And then two years ago, um, I had a really unique opportunity placed on my desk, and that was um, Wood, we're looking at rebuilding our ERP um, framework. So if, if you know those listening aren't completely familiar, that is the back office system that all of our, our functional teams work within. So whether it's procurement or um, P&O, finance, all of those back office functions um, utilize what we call our ERP or connected system in order to process transactions through to get from the beginning to the end of the, the business cycle. Um, so Wood entered into a strategic um, program where we are kind of resetting some of those processes and building out a new system to support our global business. So I had the opportunity to step across and lead the functional side of that, that implementation program two years ago. Um, and it's been a really exciting two years. So very different from the last 11 years that I've spent with Wood, um, but one that's been you know, really valuable to me and, and one that I know that for the, the remainder of my career, I'll look back on as a really unique opportunity to really pave the way for the business. Um, and it's just, it's really, it's really interesting and I'm extremely grateful if I kind of pause right there to, to have had that opportunity. And I think it is, you know, in, in part to the, the experiences that, that I've had up to this point. Um, but yeah, a really rewarding career at Wood, um, a really vast um, and breadth of experience so far, um, which I will say is, is, you know, an extremely valuable thing about Wood and the experience and, and many, um, you know, large oil and gas companies as well, that there are a lot of different things that you can do within, um, within the finance community. And it's really, you know, it's really a, a blessing to have had some of those opportunities, so. I'm glad that uh, I usually let the guests kind of do their bio because I wouldn't have got like not even half of the amazing experience that you have and that you just showcased. And I can't even believe 13 years. It sounds like a full 30 year career with just how much opportunity you've had. And, yeah. roles. and I think that's what's exciting when you're looking for a place to work is that like, that career progression and opportunity. That's what everyone's looking for. So yeah. it seems, you know, you've had such, such different variety of roles and you're, you know, 13 years in, you're still kind of like excited about, you know, the future. And I think that's really nice to hear. Um, so I want to kind of go back to the beginning. So finance, tell yes. me a little bit of like, what made you decide to even like think of CPA or finance and like did anyone in your family kind of, because I'm trying to look back at like my childhood. I don't think I ever thought of finance as like a job. So I'm really curious to see where that love for, you know, numbers came from. Yeah, absolutely. So no, neither one of my parents are, are um, accountants or work in the finance community. Um, my mom's a nurse and my dad is actually a draftsman. So um, neither one of them kind of pushed me in that direction, but I do love numbers and I love structure and I love solving problems. So I would say um, those things, uh, are probably what directed me towards uh, the finance space. You know, coming out of high school, I'm not sure that I could have ever envisioned where I would be. And even graduating from A&M, kind of thinking I'm, a, I'm, I'm on the track to be a certified accountant. What does that mean? I, I never in a million years would have envisioned where I am today and what I'm doing today at that point in time. But I think that's what's really exciting about it is I love the structure of it. I love, I do love, genuinely love numbers. Uh, but I love solving problems. And I think that's the, the beauty of it is that there are so many different opportunities within this career um, space that you can kind of you can kind of 
um, maneuver it and make it what what works for you with your skill set and passion. So, yeah, I love that you shared that. And it's nice to your point is you don't know what can lead you through a career or even like see your future and just all of the amazing jobs that you've had. You can never see that when you're like graduating, you know, on stage. So I think that's what's exciting is like you could be the CEO of your career and really drive it in any way, shape or form that you want. Stay within finance or even take your finance degree and kind of go into operations and kind of, you know, do other things. So I think that's what's interesting. So, you know, a lot of people, I would say, don't really know, like, like they, we all kind of know what finance is, but there's so many different things. There's like treasury and then there's controllers and there's financial analysts. And it's kind of confusing because it's a whole world of finance. Yeah. I want to pick just, I guess, controller because you mentioned you were that. And that's kind of, I think, like the more popular one that I think people can relate to. Can you tell us a little bit of like, what does a controller do and how do you kind of interact with the operations, with the leadership team, with people who are out in the field or who are out doing the work? And kind of how do you come together every quarter to kind of report those financials? Yeah, absolutely. So the role of controller within Wood specifically, and, and I would say, you know, there's probably a bit of grayness within the, the title, depending on where you are. But that role specifically was focused on um, understanding the results, whether it be from a budget and forecast perspective. So when you look at it from that perspective, what do we think we're going to do from a financial performance standpoint over the next 12, 18 months for a particular part of the business? So the controller role was really focused on taking each of the component BUs within the organization that I was responsible for and understanding, again, whether it was a forecast or a budget. So the forward looking position or a historical position. So at the end of the month, at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year, how did we perform against those targets that we set last month or six months ago? So that was a big component of that role is working within the the leadership teams of each of the component BUs and understanding the performance of those BUs. Um, a large component of the role was also just setting the structure around how do we do that. So Wood is a publicly traded company. We do have a parent organization that sets a lot of the structure around how from a monthly, a quarterly or a half yearly perspective do we need to be reporting our financial results. But within the controller role, there, there was a large focus on how do we then take that down to our BU so that there's clarity around what the expectations are on how they're going to report their results, um, how they're going to, to build up their budget and their forecast, how they're going to report that in, and then really understanding that. So sitting alongside in that role, I sat alongside the CFO of the business unit and really partnered. I was effectively the right hand to that, that CFO and really helping him to understand, you know, what was coming in from the businesses as a first pass and starting to paint that picture of what's the story around the performance of the business. So how do we take it from just its numbers on a page and we've either hit our targets or we've missed our targets to really understanding the story and being able to communicate that to executive leaders. Um, and in that role, I did have, you know, it, it's a breadth of network, both on the finance side of the community. And again, as you said, the operations um, side, because finance exists only to support the operations, right? So we are there to help the business understand how do they make the most money? How are they the most profitable? What, are, what, you know, understanding the operations of the business, what do we expect our financial performance to look like for the next 12 to 18 months? And what levers do we potentially have to make that um, improve that over, over time? So in that role, it really was about taking all of the pieces from the respective component BUs and pulling that together into a collective um, consolidated position um, at the senior leadership level so that it could be articulated in such a way that it's understood um, in driving that performance. So it's a really unique role and an exciting one um, as well. I like what you mentioned about it's not just kind of the numbers on the paper because or like on the Excel sheet because it is, but it's like the story that you tell behind it that is the impact so you take like those numbers and just showcase a good or bad story depending on like what's happening right um, so I, think, I think that's important and just how much kind of the finance people have impact wise on a business but i think sometimes very similar to kind of like the contracts folks etc it's more like admin ish in the background you only think of operations but 
you're, you're running all the money. You're the ones with the budgets. You're the ones kind of keeping everyone in check and compliance, et cetera. So it's really, really interesting once you actually dive deep into the finance world. That's um, right. Looking in terms of, I want to know a little bit more of like the work-life balance. Uh, you mentioned you have a son, uh, you know, family. And I know from the controllers that I know, uh, it's crunch time every quarter or even at the end of the month because you guys have to kind of like present the numbers and they disappear for like a week. Like you cannot get a hold of them. So I wanted to know, like, is that very similar? I'm assuming in your world it is where it's like a certain, yeah. days, a certain days where you're like, nobody talked to me. You know, how do you handle, because it is very, I think it's, there's a lot of pressure there because at the end of the day, they're waiting for these numbers. So how do you deal with yeah. that? And especially with your son or with your family, like, do they know, you know, mom, mom is in that time of the month where she's busy, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is one that I think, you know, I get asked that question sometimes, how do you manage the work-life balance? And I do think it is a really, for each person, it looks so different. And I'll say even, each role that I've been in, it's looked slightly different. So currently the role that I'm in is a global role. So actually most of my team, I, I office in Houston, most of my team offices in the UK. So currently I'll start my day really early before anyone in the house is awake, get an hour or two of work done, and then I'll pause for an hour, hour and a half, get my daughter, she's eight, get her up for school, get her ready for school and out the door, and then get my son, same thing, get him up, get him ready, get him out the door, um, and then go on about my day. And then depending on what sports we've got in the afternoon, and then my husband works full time as well. So between the two of us, we kind of, we flex that. Um, I will say, they, they are definitely aware that there are some times when, you know, mom's going to be at the office late or mom's going to be logged on quite late. I have over my career tried to really focus on figuring out what's really important for me. So if I want to be at that sports practice or if I want to be at that game on a Thursday night, but I know I've got a lot going on and have a deadline looming, then I'll figure out how to make that work for me personally. And sometimes that looks like leave the office at four or five or, or turn my computer off at four or five, go to that game and then log back on in the evening. And it works for me. And I'm, I'm completely, you know, comfortable doing that. And again, I think it, it, it is a personal decision and it takes a lot of flexibility and my husband is wonderful and, and takes a lot of slack as well. So I think having that kind of partnership and having someone, whether it's a husband, a parent, a friend, a neighbor, to, to kind of help when you do have those um, kind of really busy times, to your point, it's cyclical. So there are days or weeks that do become more challenging than others. Um, it's it's invaluable um, to have that help and, and really just understanding that, you know, you have to do what makes sense for you. And, and that looks a little bit different for every single person. And, you know, I'm really grateful Wood is, has always been a place that's been very flexible regarding that. So you you need to get the work done and, and there's expectations there. But at the same time, there's there's a load of flexibility for you to kind of figure out what what works for you. Um, and so that, that's that been the way I've managed it for my career. And, you know, it's worked for us and, and certainly worked for me personally. So I'm glad you shared that. It's kind of the million dollar question that people always have, especially for women who are in leadership positions or you know, who have climbed up, you know, the corporate ladder is like, how do you do it all? And I, I, one thing I really stood out in your conversation was when you said, like, you've got to figure out what are priorities for you and what matters, because you can't do it all. You can't go yeah. to every single game. You can't go to every yeah. single after school activity. So I'm glad you mentioned, like, what are those things that, like, I really care about that I want to show up for my kids for? And those yeah. are the things that you do. And you kind of just make it work where you work late at night, et cetera. So I think that's really good advice. Um, on the topic uh, of your initial bio, when you mentioned, you know, you said no twice to a job um, that was a promotion and that, you know, they knew that stuff and you can do this because they wouldn't be offering it to you if they didn't think that you were qualified and can do it. Tell us a little bit about that, because I think a lot of people listening, uh, especially women, they will relate to that and feel like they've done that maybe or, you know. They, we're just worried that we we can't handle it, especially maybe because you have a young family, et cetera. But you said that that was probably the most pivotal moment in your career and it, it brought you to where you are today. So I would hate yep. to see other women miss out on those opportunities. So I think we can learn a lot from you and 
kind of, can you walk us through when maybe they offered it to you and how you said no twice? I'm glad they came back a second time. <laughs> so says yeah. a lot about the leadership team, you know, but tell us a little bit about that and maybe some advice you can give to younger girls who will eventually be faced with a young family and a promotion. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, it, you know, you, you hit it spot on in that I think oftentimes we, and I will, I'll put myself in this camp as women, you, you have long, young children, you, you kind of think you, you can't do it all. And to your point, you know, to the previous conversation, sometimes you do have to make minor sacrifices based on the things that are, you know, not, not as important to you. And you know, you can flex on those. Um, but I think taking that step back and to your point, realizing that the oftentimes the leadership team that's around you, if they're offering you an opportunity, they're offering you that opportunity because they have the faith in you that they know that you can you can do it and that you've got a support network around you that will help you get get to the place that you need to be. Um, and it was just that it was, you know, I was I was a mother of a really young son um, and wanted to make sure that I had the time to do all of those things and hadn't yet had to kind of work through how do I flex work with home and being a mom and, and doing all of those things. So it was getting over that hurdle and it's really scary. So I'll equate it to coming back to work when you have a newborn baby, you almost just can psych yourself out on that first day, but you just have to get over that hurdle to realize like, I can do this. I can, I can find a balance that works for me and I can, I can do it. Um, and so it was getting over that first hurdle. And, and I was really, really grateful that the, the team that I, the leadership team that was there at the time really did give me that opportunity. So they didn't take it as a Stephanie doesn't want to progress in her career. It was really, they saw and I, I communicated why I was fearful in taking the role and they, they, in a in a supportive way pushed me to take the role and kind of gave me that confidence that I could do it and we could work out a, a schedule that worked for me. And, you know, I think that was the point in my career where I realized, you know, saying no to opportunities sometimes is the right thing to do because it truly doesn't fit for you and you know that and you've had the time to kind of evaluate that and get to that position. But also saying no just solely out of fear that it's something new or something different, or I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to make this work is probably not the best route. Oftentimes um, that it is, you know, find those people around you that can support you um, find those mentors that you can talk to and kind of bounce ideas off of if you are a bit concerned about a new opportunity. But I think it was that that's really shaped me to say, you know, if an opportunity is placed on your desk, you should really give it some serious consideration, even if it's one that scares you to no end, that those are the ones that, you know, when you take that step back and go, was this a transformational role in my career and my journey? Or what did I take away from it? I think those are oftentimes the ones that you step back and just are, you know, mind blown at how much you took away from that role. So, I, that is, that is a decision that has stepped, you know, stood out to me over the last eight, 10 years that is really a turning point for me to say, I, I don't need to be afraid. And there are people around to help kind of guide me through and support me through some of these more challenging experiences. So. I'm glad you shared that. Cause I think it's really valuable, um, you know, knowledge and just advice because we will be faced that at some point where a big opportunity is going to come in your table and, I like that you said, like, don't say no out of fear, like say no out of other reasons that could be more concrete and you're like, sure that this isn't for you. But if it's fear, then you should tap into that because it could be life changing or career changing, you know? So, yeah. um, so on the last question that I had for you was you kind of run, run us already through a day in the life of mentioning you work, you know, overseas, it's global. So you kind of start early. What I wanted to know a little bit more of on the role for anyone who's interested in, you know, eventually becoming a Stephanie is, you know, what is it, what does your day look like in terms of meetings, in terms of like alone time to look at the numbers, um, you know, reading articles or reading, you know, internal financial, uh, you know, numbers. Um, and then is it a lot of like in person? Is it a lot of uh, teams, you know, online? And do you have to travel a lot? Because I think a lot of people always want one day, you know, how much travel is involved? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll give kind of two two different answers. One being in the in the space of the current role that I'm in right now, which is more of a, a specific special project type role. And that one um, that one is kind of from a leadership perspective. I do spend a lot of my time um, in meetings just around governance on the project, 
you know, where are we against where we expected to be from a delivery of the, the system and the overall process development. Um, so I spend a lot of my time in meetings, really just understanding where we are, how I can help escalate challenges, how I can help unblock for the team. So at this point, it is a lot about really kind of maneuvering and, and positioning and using the network that I've built up to, to kind of help unblock things where necessary and supporting the team appropriately. Um, and I would say that that's, that's quite unique to the roles that most of the finance roles, and this is probably a special, special project in my career. So I'll maybe give a bit more in-depth answer to, to kind of the core finance roles that, that most people would experience um, in this space. And that is, um, you know, from a day to day perspective, it, it, it is sitting in, in a lot of discussions, you know, so understanding and really um, boiling down the position. So whether we're in a, a core forecast cycle or a core budget cycle, sitting with the appropriate people within the finance community, within the leadership teams to understand and close out whatever actions are in place at that point in time. Um, would um, in general, it's probably a, a mix between in-person meetings and teams meetings. So it's, it's a good balance. Um, some teams are, are more situated in person and my current role, again, most of my teams is that, or most of my team is in the UK. Um, so I do a lot of my meetings on teams, um, which works for us. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it's really about kind of boiling that, that big picture down and, and being able to understand it. So sitting in quite a, a lot of meetings, um, I do make a really big effort to try to carve out and it's, it's difficult to carve out enough time to really focus. So in the, again, in the current role that I'm in, it's, you know, what additional gaps do we have? What do we need to be thinking about in order to close out to get to the final position of the project? In a controller type role, it, it would be, you know, taking that step back and really thinking about, you know, what additional questions do we need to be asking, um, doing a bit of research on the market or the industry that we're sitting in um, to really understand that picture. So um, hopefully that gives a, a, a bit of a glimpse into some of the day in a life, um, depending on whether whether you're in kind of a, a corporate finance role um, or more of a, a special projects role. Um, in both of those roles, I'd say it's limited travel. So from a finance perspective, um, it's some travel, but not not um, not extensive oh, as you would have. Yes, as you would have in some some other roles within the, the functional areas. Yeah, no, thank you, Stephanie. It definitely kind of gives us a lot of an insight on kind of somebody who would like a, a role in finance and kind of what the day into life looks like. And also just career opportunities, because I think sometimes people think finance is a little bit more limited than maybe if you do other types of leadership roles. But, you know, clearly not. You have so much opportunity and really finance touches, in my opinion, every part of the business. Yeah. And so you, there is a lot of career growth. And so you know, to end, I know we already said that was the last question, but, you know, what's one piece of advice that you would give, you know, someone starting on their first day, maybe it's your daughter or son in a few years, you know, what is like one corporate lesson or advice you want to leave us with? Yeah, I would say there's probably two, two things in my mind. One would be always give it your best. So I think day in, day out, regardless of what you're doing, you really need to be focused on how do I bring my best self and my best work to the workplace. The second would be, um, don't be afraid of lateral movement. So, you know, again, I've had a lot of experience hopping from different types of roles and not all of those would be considered a step up. And to be honest, some of the roles in all reality, if you took a step back, may have been considered slight a slight step down or at a minimum, a, a lateral role, but those are the best opportunities. So I think if you think about, you know, I want I want a career progression that looks a bit like, you know, a straight line upwards. It's not always like that. And I think it's just, you know, not being afraid of taking a role that helps to build the breadth in your resume, even if it isn't a direct step up. Um, and I got that that advice early on in my career. And it was one that, you know, really took to heart that breadth is really important um, and ensuring that you've seen different things, you have different experiences really does put you in a position where you're well rounded and you're well suited for those opportunities when they do present themselves. So be both amazing way to end the po you know, podcast really uh, so insightful. And I, you know, just could keep talking to you uh, for another hour or so. So thank you so much for saying yes to coming on these Lunch and Learn series with Wood. 
we all got to learn a little bit of the finance world, which so far we hadn't had anyone from finance. So thank you so much, Stephanie, for you know taking your time and for such great advice. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. All right, well, if you guys enjoyed this, make sure you tune in next month for the next professional who will be featured at Wood. See you later.